Roughing It by Mark Twain. Next day I got away on the coach with the usual eclat, attending departures of all old citizens. For if you have only half a dozen friends out there, they will make noise for a hundred rather than let you seem to go away neglected and unregretted. And Dan promised to keep strict watch for the men that it had the mind to sell. The trip was signalized, but by one little incident, and that occurred just as we were about to start. A very seedy-looking vagabond passenger got out of the stage a moment to wait till the usual ballast of silver bricks was thrown in. He was standing on the pavement when an awkward express employee carrying a brick weighing a hundred pounds stumbled and let it fall on the bummer's foot. He instantly dropped on the ground and began to howl in the most heartbreaking way. A sympathizing crowd gathered around and were going to pull his boot off, but he screamed louder than ever and they desisted. Then he fell to gasping and between the gasps ejaculated, Brandy! For heaven's sake, brandy! They poured half a pint down him, and it wonderfully restored and comforted him. Then he begged the people to assist him to the stage, which was done. The express people urged him to have a doctor at their expense, but he declined and said that if he only had a little brandy to take along with him to soothe his paroxysms of pain when they came on, he would be grateful and content. He was quickly supplied with two bottles, and we drove off. He was so smiling and happy after that that I could not refrain from asking him how he could possibly be be so comfortable with a crushed foot. Well, said he, I hadn't had a drink for twelve hours and hadn't a cent to my name. It was most perishing. And so when that duffer dropped that hundred pounder on my foot, I see my chance. Got a cork leg, you know, and he pulled off his pantaloons and proved it. He was as drunk as a lord all day long, and full of chuckles over his timely ingenuity. One drunken man necessarily reminds me of another. I once heard of a gentleman tell about an incident which he witnessed in a California bar room. He entitled it, Ye Modest Man Taketh the Drink. It was nothing but a bit of acting, but it seemed to me a perfect rendering, and worthy of Toodles himself, the modest man, tolerably far gone with beer and other matters, enters a saloon. Twenty-five cents is the price for anything and everything, and specie the only money used. Or specie, or S-P-E-C-I-E, and lays down a half dollar calls for whiskey and drinks it. The barkeeper makes change and lays the quarter in a wet place on the counter. The modest man fumbles at it with nerveless fingers, but it slips and the water holds it. He contemplates it and tries again. Same result. Observes that people are interested in what he is at. Blushes, fumbles at the quarter again, blushes, Puts his forefinger carefully, slowly down to make sure of his aim. Pushes the coin toward the barkeeper and says with a sigh, Give me a cigar. Naturally, another gentleman present told about another drunken man. He said he reeled toward home late at night, made a mistake, and entered the wrong gate. Though he saw a dog on the stoop, and it was an iron one. He stopped and considered, wondering if it was a dangerous dog, ventured to say, Be be gone! No effect. Then he approached warily and adopted conciliation, pursed up his lips and tried to whistle but failed, still approaching and saying, Poor dog, doggy, 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 poor doggy dog. Got up on the stoop, still petting with fond names, still master of the advantages, then exclaimed, Leave, you thief! Planted a vindictive kick in his ribs, and went head over heels overboard, of course. A pause, a sigh or two of pain, and then a remark in a reflective voice, 
awful solid dog. What could he be eating? Rocks, perhaps such animals is dangerous. That's what I say. They're dangerous. If a man... If a man wants to feed a dog on rocks, let him feed him on rocks. That's all right. But let him have a own. Not have that's all right. But let him keep him at home. Not have him lying around promiscuous, where where people's liable to stumble over him when they ain't noticing. It was not without regret that I took a last look at the tiny flag. It was 35 feet long and 10 feet wide, fluttering like a lady's handkerchief from the topmost peak of Mount Davidson, 2,000 feet above Virginia's roofs and felt that doubtless I was bidding a permanent farewell to a city which had afforded me the most vigorous enjoyment of life I had ever experienced. And this reminds me of an incident which the dullest memory Virginia could boast at the time. It happened most vividly recall at times till its possessor dies. Late one summer afternoon we had a rain shower. That was astonishing enough in itself to set the whole town buzzing for it only rains during a week or two weeks in the winter in Nevada, and even then not enough at a time to make it worthwhile for any merchant to keep umbrellas for sale. But the rain was not the chief wonder. It only lasted five or ten minutes. While the people were still talking about it all, the heavens gathered to themselves a dense blackness as of midnight. All the vast eastern front of Mount Davidson overlooking the city put on such a funeral gloom that only the nearness and solidity of the mountain made its outlines even faintly distinguishable from the dead blackness of the heavens that rested against, they rested against. This unaccustomed sight turned all eyes toward the mountain, and as they looked, a little tongue of rich golden flame was seen waving and quivering in the heart of the midnight away up on the extreme summit. In a few minutes the streets were packed with people gazing with hardly an uttered word at the one brilliant moat in the brooding world of darkness. It flickered, it flicked like a candle flame and looked no larger. But with such a background it was wonderfully bright, small as it was. It was the flag though no one suspected it at first. It seemed so like a supernatural visitor of some kind, a mysterious messenger of good tidings, some were fain to believe. It was the nation's emblem, transfigured by the departing rays of a sun that was entirely palled from view, and on no other object did the glory fall, in all the broad panorama of mountain ranges and deserts not even upon the staff of the flag, for that a needle in the distance at any time was now untouched by the light and indistinguishable, undistinguishable in the gloom. For a whole hour the weird visitor winked and burned in its lofty solitude, and still the thousands of uplifted eyes watched it with fascinated interest. How the people were wrought up. The superstition grew apace, that this was a mystic courier come with great news from the war, the poetry of the idea excusing and commending it, and on it spread from heart to heart, from lip to lip, and from street to street, till there was a general impulse to have out the military and welcome the bright way for the salvo of artillery. And all that time one sorely tired man, the telegraph operator, sworn to official secrecy, had to lock his lips and chain his tongue with a silence that was like to rend them, for he, and he only of the speculating multitude, knew the great things the sinking sun, this sinking sun had seen that day in the east, Vicksburg fallen, and a Union army arms victorious at Gettysburg. But for the journalistic monopoly that forbade the slightest revealment of Eastern news till a day after its publication in the California papers, the glorified 
flag on Mount Davidson would have been saluted and result, resulted that memorable evening. As long as there was a charge of powder to thunder with, the city would have been illuminated, and every man that had any respect for himself would have got drunk, as was the custom of the country on all occasions of public moment. Even at this distant day, I cannot think of this needlessly marred supreme opportunity without regret. What a time we might have had. Chapter 56 Off for San Francisco Western and Eastern Landscapes The Hottest Place on Earth Summer and Winter We rumbled over the plains and valleys, climbed the Sierras to the clouds, and looked down upon summer-clad California. All I will remark here in passing, oh, and I will remark here in passing, that all scenery in California requires distance to give it its highest charm. The mountains are imposing in their sublimity and their majesty of form and altitude from any point of view. But one must have distance to soften their ruggedness and enrich their tintings. A Californian forest is best at a little distance. For there is a sad poverty of variety and species, the trees being chiefly of one monotonous family, redwood, pine, spruce, fir. And so at a near view there is a wearisome sameness of attitude in their rigid arms, stretched downward and outward in one continued and reiterated appeal to all men to shh, don't say a word. You might disturb somebody. Close at hand, too, there is a reliefless and relentless smell of pitch and turpentine. There is a ceaseless melancholy in their sighing and complaining foliage. One walks over a soundless carpet of beaten yellow bark and dead spines of the foliage till he feels like a wandering spirit, bereft of a footfall. He tires of the endless tufts of needles and yarns for substantial shapely leaves. He looks for moss and grass to loll upon and finds none. For where there is no bark there is naked clay and dirt enemies to pensive musing and clean apparel. Often a grassy plain in California is what it should be, but often too it is best contemplated at a distance, because although its grass blades are tall, they stand up vindictively straight and self-sufficient, and are unsociably wide apart, with uncommonly spots of barren sand between. One of the queerest things I know of is to hear tourists from the States go into ecstasies over the loveliness of ever-blooming California, and they always do go into that sort of ecstasies. But perhaps they would modify them if they knew how old Californians, with a memory full upon them of the dust-covered and 